Vertigo is defined as the illusion of movement, often described as a sensation that the environment is spinning or of being on a boat. There are several different causes of vertigo, which we'll go through, including a way to easily remember them. It's also important to remember that vertigo is a symptom and not a diagnosis in itself. It is closely resembled by dizziness, often being used interchangeably, especially by patients. Dizziness is a non-specific term that describes sensations such as feeling faint or lightheaded, unsteady or even spaced out. Workup of vertigo should also include consideration of causes of dizziness such as reduced perfusion to the brain due to hypotension, drug effects, hypoxia or hypoglycemia, and psychiatric causes like panic. To make them easy to remember, I divide the causes of vertigo based on the duration. The most common cause of vertigo is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV, classically featuring episodic vertigo lasting several seconds, typically under 30 seconds, and usually associated with a positional change of the head. For example, bending to pick something up or rolling over in bed. Normally, the semicircular canals convey information on the position of the head in space as the fluid called endolymph within them moves and stimulates or inhibits small hair-like sensors depending on the direction of movement. These then send the proprioceptive information to the cerebellum via the vestibular nerve. In BPPV, symptoms occur due to small crystals called otoconia being present within the vestibular semicircular canals, most commonly the posterior one. Presence of these otoconia can stimulate the hair cells without the head actually moving, leading to vertigo. The diagnosis is clinical, with nystagmus and potentially symptom reproduction being present on the Dix Hallpike maneuver. Treatment is through particle repositioning movements, the most well known being the Epley maneuver, and up to 95% of people are symptom free for the next six months when they're done by an appropriate professional. Most cases will spontaneously remit anyway within six months. Vertigo lasting several hours is most commonly a vestibular migraine an often overlooked diagnosis despite being the most common cause of spontaneous vertigo. These can occur with or without associated headache, but may also feature photo and phonophobia, meaning an aversion to light and sound respectively. Often there is a family history of migraine, and it is three times commoner in females than in males. Diagnosis is clinical, and treatment involves lifestyle changes addressing the most common triggers of stress, poor sleep, dehydration, and hormonal changes. For example, menstruation. Typical migraine treatment, such as triptans, in the acute setting has shown some benefit, and prophylaxis can feature agents like propanolol, topiramate, or amitriptyline. Meniere's disease can also cause episodic, unprovoked vertigo lasting several hours. There is debate over how common this condition is, with some sources stating that it is a rare cause. It features vertigo alongside unilateral sensory neural hearing loss, earfulness and tinnitus, often described as roaring tinnitus. The exact cause is not known, but can be triggered by infections or metabolic causes like hypothyroidism, and overall the pathology is thought to result from excess endolymph pressure. Diagnosis is clinical, but does need evidence of sensory neural hearing loss documented through audiological testing. Treatment involves lifestyle changes like reducing salt and caffeine intake, and medications that aid symptoms can include prochlorperazine, a dopamine antagonist, or antihistamines like cinarazine, though extended use should be avoided due to vestibular suppression. And longer term, beta-histine, 
a histamine 1 receptor agonist, may be of some use. Medications that may help reduce the endolymph level, like thiazide diuretics, are also sometimes used. A relatively new condition, featuring another acronym with multiple P's, is PPPD, Persistent Postural Perceptual Dizziness which, although features dizziness in the name, describes a chronic functional condition commonly featuring non-spinning vertigo and unsteadiness, with symptoms typically lasting several hours. It is often without specific provocation, but it is worse when being upright, when there is motion without regard to direction or position, or exposure to visual stimuli, for example complex carpet patterns or people crossing roads. This leads to avoidance of these stimuli, which can be severely limiting, for example stairs or roads. These symptoms must be present daily for over three months, most commonly beginning after having experienced a triggering cause, 20% of which being BPPV or vestibular neuritis that we'll cover next, 20% of cases after vestibular migraine and anxiety in 15%. Diagnosis is based on the history and fulfilment of the Baranya Society Diagnostic Criteria, which do not feature specific physical exam or imaging findings. Treatment is primarily based on the individual, usually featuring vestibular exercises. Some evidence exists for selective serotonin or serotonin and noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors and CBT though further evidence is needed. When the vertigo lasts days, vestibular neuritis or labyrinthitis become more likely, where there is inflammation of the vestibular nerve. It is termed labyrinthitis when there is also inflammation of the cochlear nerve, which anatomically lies adjacent to the vestibular nerve. Typically, these come on following an upper respiratory tract infection and cause vertigo lasting days, alongside nausea and feeling particularly unwell, necessitating bed rest. Hearing is also affected in labyrinthitis, most commonly causing an irreversible sensory neural hearing loss, but not in vestibular neuritis. Nystagmus is often visible as a unidirectional horizontal nystagmus typically. Diagnosis, as for the others so far, is clinical. Treatment can involve use of vestibular suppressants in the form of prochlorperazine or antihistamines, however this should only be used in short duration as it can extend the time to recovery. Often there can be persisting vestibular deficits after an episode that may require vestibular rehabilitation, but most cases gradually recover over several weeks. A key differential of vertigo is a posterior circulation stroke which can be subtle and easily missed. It is a central cause of vertigo, meaning the source is the brainstem or brain, whereas other causes of vertigo are peripheral, meaning they come from dysfunction in the vestibular apparatus itself. Other examples of central causes are vestibular migraine, space occupying lesions like tumours, and multiple sclerosis. Generally, stroke is more common in those with risk factors for cardiovascular disease like old age, smokers, diabetes, obesity, and dyslipidemia. Intense vertigo, nausea, and vomiting are common, and often patients with a posterior circulation stroke will be unable to stand even with their eyes open. There will typically be other signs like dysarthria, dysphagia, diplopia, or deficits in motor or sensory function, but this is not always the case. The HINTS exam is used to distinguish a central cause of vertigo from a peripheral cause, though it should only be used when nystagmus is present. It stands for head impulse, where the patient is asked to fixate on the examiner's nose as they hold the patient's head and turn it suddenly to either side. The vestibular ocular reflex is an arc that keeps the eyes focused on the target as the head moves. In peripheral causes like neuritis, this reflex is disturbed and the patient will be unable to automatically focus on the nose as the head is turned. 
leading to a corrective saccade in central causes, this remains intact. N is for nystagmus, a rhythmic involuntary movement of the eyes, with the direction of the saccadic movement being important. Bidirectional horizontal nystagmus or vertical nystagmus suggest a central cause. The final part of the HINTS exam is the test of skew, where the patient fixates on the examiner's nose, who then covers one of the patient's eyes before then covering the other eye and uncovering the first whilst observing it for any movement. If there is presence of a vertical corrective movement, this suggests a central cause.